Welcome to Unit 2.1. In this unit of study, we're going to focus on force and its relationship to acceleration. So before we get into it, I want to make sure we clarify some major misconception about the nature of forces and motion. So I've identified what I believe to be the greatest misconception in all of physics. And it goes something like this. You might hear some people suggest that some overall amount of force must be applied in order for an object to be in a state of motion. And it might seem like that if you take the example of uh, driving your car on the highway. Now there are a few forces that act on our cars when we drive down a straight uh, stretch of the freeway. So let's identify a few of those. Well, let's identify all the forces acting on this car. The Earth pulls downward. This is the force of gravity, right? Yet the car does not accelerate in the downward direction. And that's because the road pushes up where the wheels make contact with the road. So the road pushes up against the car, and that has a way of balancing out the downward pull of gravity. Okay, and then there's a couple more forces involved. Um, the faster you go, the greater the air resistance. And there's also a little bit of rolling friction taking place between the wheels and the road. So that creates a force opposite the direction of the car's velocity. So that's right. To overcome these resistive forces, then you have to keep your foot on the gas pedal just to maintain a steady speed. So you provide a forward force, or your car's engine transmits a force um, to the wheels, which drives the car forward. Okay, so in a case like this, yeah, if you remove the forward applied force, then the car is going to slow down and it won't maintain a steady speed. But in this case, hopefully you can see that if we combine all the forces, and generally in our discussion about force in this unit of study, we're not just going to talk about any singular force when determining the state of motion for an object. We have to consider the sum of all the forces. So most of the time, we're going to reference the net amount of force acting on an object in the analysis of the object's motion. So we can say some overall net force must be applied in order for an object to be in motion. That's the misconception. So I'm going to circle that statement and cross it out, say not true. Now what if the force applied on the car, what if the forward force imparted from the car's engine was actually greater in magnitude than the backwards force of resistance. Then there would be some net amount of force in the forward direction. What would the resulting motion of the car be? Hopefully you agree that it wouldn't just be moving with some velocity in this forward direction, but it would accelerate in that direction. So that's the idea. The false statement is that some overall net force has to be applied for an object to be in motion. The correct statement is some overall net force must be applied in order for an object to change its state of motion. Some net force must be applied in order for an object to accelerate. Don't get me wrong. Let's say there is an object like this box and it's already at rest on level ground. Then without a doubt for it to be in motion, to come out of a state of rest and into a state of motion, something's going to have to come along and impress a force on that object. But then again, that would be an acceleration, wouldn't it? To go from a state of rest into a state of motion requires some net force. So what I'm saying about this car on the highway, once it's already in motion, we're not talking about what was required to get it up to speed uh, as a red light turns green. Once this car is up to speed, then the forward force 
exerted by the car's engine has to be exactly equal to the backwards force from the combined effects of friction and air resistance. And likewise, the upward force from the ground has to perfectly cancel out the downward pull of gravity. I still know there's some of you that might be thinking, no, no, to maintain a steady forward speed, that forward force has to be just a little bit bigger than the backwards force. That's absolutely not the case. When all the forces combine to equal zero on an object, we say that object is in a state of equilibrium. And if an object in a state of equilibrium is already in motion, then it just maintains motion at constant velocity. Uh, maybe you can think about this in simpler terms. If we get rid of the force of gravity by suggesting the object we're studying is a spacecraft in interstellar space. So there's no planet to pull on it and give it a force of gravity. And it's not resting against the surface or contacting the ground, so there's no longer an upward force. And since it's traveling through space, there's no air resistance acting on it. It looks like in this picture, the thrusters are on, right? You can see it looks like uh, there's some force applied in this direction. And so what's going to happen to the spacecraft? Well, it's not only going to move in the direction of this arrow, better yet, it's going to accelerate in that direction, OK? Actually, there's no guarantee that it's moving in this direction. It could have already been moving backwards. And what this thrust would do is slow it down, maybe eventually bringing it to rest and then reversing it back in this direction. OK, but I, what I really want you to imagine is what happens when the thrusters are turned off. So whatever speed this spacecraft is maintained, when the thrusters are off and the net force is truly zero, does that mean the spacecraft suddenly comes to rest? No. Whatever velocity that spacecraft had at the moment the thruster turns off and it reaches a state of equilibrium, then the spacecraft is just going to maintain a constant velocity from there on out. So uh, I guess I've got ahead of myself and I've stated this second misconception that an object in equilibrium must be at rest. So imagine playing air hockey. Uh, again, kind of like this example, the hockey puck on an air hockey table is not influenced by forces of friction or air resistance to any large degree. So all forces are negligible aside from the table pushing up and the pull of gravity acting downward. But I don't think I have to work too hard to convince you that those forces cancel one another out. OK, so then if you hit that hockey puck, you're going to take it out of a state of rest and into a state of motion. But that force only lasts briefly. You don't continue to hit the hockey puck uh, all the time. You just give it a brief amount of force. That force gets the hockey puck out of a state of rest and into a state of motion, and then it just wants to glide at a steady speed until it experiences another force. Now, maybe that happens when it hits the uh, side of the air hockey table, and then that will change the direction of the velocity. Maybe it'll bounce in this direction. And then from there, it would just want to maintain this constant velocity until another force is applied. OK, so while the object is drifting, at a steady speed. There's no force in the forward or backward direction. The upward force from the table is canceled out the downward force. And so you can imagine that the sum of all forces acting on the puck, as long as nothing is colliding with it, is equal to zero. So that doesn't mean it's at rest. It could be. OK, so again, whenever the sum of all forces is equal to zero, we say the object is in a state of equilibrium. You're going to hear that uh, term a lot throughout this unit of study. So one of two things could happen when an object is in a state of equilibrium. It could be at rest. After all, if the hockey puck's just sitting there, it hasn't been hit, there's been no collision, a hockey puck at rest wants to stay at rest as long as there's no force to influence its motion. But if that hockey puck is already in motion with some amount of velocity, 
and it's in a state of equilibrium, no other forces act on it, then it's just going to stay in motion at constant velocity. I think there's a lot of people that assume if the object's in equilibrium, it has to be at rest, and they ignore the second possibility that it could be moving with a constant velocity. Okay. So the big idea is, what if the net force doesn't equal zero? Well, in that case, an object is going to accelerate. It's either going to go from a state of rest into a state of motion, or if it's already in a state of motion, it's going to move faster or slow down or change direction. So this might lead us then to the third misconception, that an object always moves uh, in the direction of the net applied force. Let me make sure I'm crossing out these misconception statements. An object in equilibrium doesn't have to be at rest. It could be. It could also be moving. Okay, third misconception. Objects always move in the direction of the net applied force. Let's uh, replace this box and just represent it as a dot there. That dot represents the box. Now let's think about some forces that are for sure acting on it. So it's resting on a carpeted floor, and that floor pushes up against the box. It's influenced by the pull of gravity, and that acts downward. Those two have to cancel one another out, or else it would be accelerating either up or downward. Now then, let me just suggest there are two other forces acting on this box, okay? So we're going to say this is the force from the ground. Say that's gravity. And then I'll tell you there's a applied force or a push. And then there's also a force like this. We'll call that friction. OK. So uh, first question, this should be pretty simple. In what direction is the object moving? Okay, well, you're probably right with your guess that the object is moving this way. But be careful. The reason the object is moving this way isn't so much because it always moves in the direction of the larger of the two forces. I think the giveaway that the object is moving to the right is that the force of friction is pointing to the left. Friction always opposes um, the direction of motion. Okay, so let me draw again without labeling force vectors. What if I told you for that same box, these combinations of force exist? There's an upward force, a downward force, a force to the left, and a force to the right. Okay, in what direction is this object moving? Again, most people are going to guess that it's moving to the left. That's what this picture kind of looks like. But it would be entirely possible that the object is moving um, to the right. But I'll guarantee you, if the object is moving to the right, that it's slowing down. So that's a big misconception about uh, force vectors. Some people think force vectors will show you the direction of motion. They don't. Force vectors will show you the direction of the acceleration. So if the force to the left is greater than the force to the right, then the net force points to the left. But all that tells us is that the acceleration points to the left. But isn't it possible for an object to have a velocity pointing to the right and simultaneously have an acceleration pointing to the left? Sure, that just means the object is slowing down as it moves to the right. How about this diagram? It looks like all four of those vectors are of equal length. I hope that's how you view it. Now I ask the question, in which direction is it moving? 
Hit pause if you want to. Invite somebody else into this lecture and ask them the same question. When you're ready for the answer, uh, unpause and see if my explanation agrees with your answer. Okay, ready? Okay, so welcome back. Hopefully you have your answer. The answer is, there's no way to know. It's entirely possible that this object is moving upward. After all, the only thing we know about a diagram like this is that all the forces cancel one another out so that the sum of all forces is equal to zero. And that means the object is in equilibrium, which in turn means the acceleration has to equal zero, which means it could either one, be at rest, or two, it can be in motion. If it is in motion and doesn't accelerate, then it means the state of motion is constant velocity. But how are we to know in what direction that constant velocity vector points? Is it up? Is it down? Could it even be up and to the left? Sure, it could be any of those. The only thing we know from a force diagram that looks like this is that whatever the velocity vector is, it isn't going to change. So the object could be at rest, it could be in motion, but we have no idea from the force diagram in what direction it's moving. The only thing we know when we look at a force diagram is in what direction the object would be accelerating. One last test of this idea. There's some hypothetical object. There's one force acting like that, another force pointing in this direction, there's a force in that direction, and a force about the same size in that direction. Now I'm not going to ask in which direction the object is moving, I'm going to ask in which direction is the object accelerating. Well in that case it's clear as day. The object's acceleration vector points like this. Okay, so Keep all of those misconceptions in your head. Try to challenge your understanding of the relationship between force and acceleration as we move on through this unit of study.